First Book Bits podcast brings you Rolf Potts, author, essayist, screenwriter, lecturer, podcaster, and long-term traveler, who is most known for his best-selling book, Vagabonding, An Uncommon Guide to the Art of Long-Term World Travel. Rolf, thanks for being a guest on the show. Michael, good to talk to you today. No worries. Now, for my audience um, who don't know who you are, I know you've done some serious travel, uh, you've written some amazing books and sort of traveled the world as well, but take us back to um, the 18-year-old you. Where did you grow up mm. and sort of what were you dreaming about as an 18-year-old? Well, I grew up in Kansas, which is right in the middle of the United States. Um, and it's about as far from an ocean or other country as you can get in the United States. And I think I was dreaming of travel, but I didn't know I had permission to travel. I didn't know that travel is something that you could do when you were young. Uh, and in a way, uh, even though I wrote Vagabonding 10 years later, uh, it was sort of written to my 18-year-old self, sort of giving me permission to do it now. Because in the United States, in particular, there's this idea that you know you're supposed to immediately finish high school and then university and then get your internship and your job and work really hard and then at the end of your work life you can retire and take some sort of holiday. But um, that didn't that seemed dubious to me because actually when I was 18, my my grandfather who'd worked harder than anybody I'd ever met, he was a farmer here in Kansas, and uh, his wife got my grandmother got Alzheimer's disease and didn't really have a chance to enjoy his retirement, not that he was really going to be a traveler, but he didn't get it, enjoy his, what I call in the book, time wealth, you know, just the idea that there's a certain amount of time that you can enjoy in a way that aligns with your dreams versus the, the work that you have to do. So that was a really heartbreaking realization. And I realized I had, when I was quite young, that I had to figure out a way to travel when I was young. And gosh, um, probably I, I planned my first trip when I was about 20 or 21, I did it when I was 23, thinking I would scratch my travel itch and I could get it out of my system and be a good American workaholic and then, you know, return to travel if I wanted to. But I, what happened is that I I realized that travel was a lot cheaper and safer and easier than uh, than I'd been told. You know, that I, I, I worked as a landscaper for eight months to save for this money for this van trip around North America. Now it's called hashtag van loft. I didn't know that's what it was at the time. But I lived in a van. Um, just lived very cheaply. And it was just so exciting. I think even in the United States, there's this idea that it's not safe to travel. It's not safe to park your vehicle and, and spend the night in it or to go to certain parts of the United States. And I just learned that it, it was just easier if you use common sense. Uh, if you don't really overspend, there are ways to travel in an exciting and, and life-changing way. And so I've said before, I've even done a podcast uh, episode about this, that that first trip living in a van when I was 23, I'm now 51, uh, but that time was, I'll never have a trip like it just because I learned so much and it really opened my eyes to what travel can do. Yeah, so thank you for sharing that. Just to unpack it, to give people some context. So you were born in 1970 and you said, so you sort of your first travel was 21, 22. So we're talking early 90s. Uh, is that correct? Yeah, 1994. I left on New Year's Day, 1994, and I got back probably in August. I came full circle in about August of that year. Yeah, and the book didn't come out till 2003. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So just to fill in the the, the timeline there, uh, after I got back, I tried to write a narrative book uh, about that experience. I tried to be write my Jack Kerouac on the road and. I failed, but it was a good failure because I really learned a lot about writing. And this is good advice for anyone who thinks about writing. Just just do it and, and bash your head up against it. And sometimes it succeeds, but when it doesn't succeed, there's a lot of things that can be learned from failure. And I learned a lot of writing lessons from failure, but then I also ran out of money. And um, it was possible. I had some friends at the time who were working teaching English as a foreign language in Korea. And they were good college friends of mine, still good college friends of mine. I'm, I'm going to go out to the Pacific Northwest next month to celebrate one of their 50th birthday. Um, but they said, you know, just stop, stop worrying about things. Come over here and make some money. If you like Korea, if you like travel, if you like another culture or not, at least you can make some money. Well, I ended up liking all of it. It was stressful at first, but living in another culture really taught me a lot of important lessons and lessons that I still use to this day. It did earn me money. It earned me my nest egg for travel. And so after two years of teaching in Korea, 
a profession that I liked. My parents are teachers. And so uh, it came somewhat naturally to me. I started traveling Asia for two years. And this was back in the early days of the internet world, of the online world. And I started writing a bi-monthly column for salon.com, just about my travel adventures. And that got the attention of some people. And that started my travel writing career, which is, gosh, now over 20 years old. And it was through a weird set of circumstances, which I can tell you about if you're interested, that yeah, I ended I up totally getting- am. Yeah, I want to know the, I want to know the early stuff. So everyone knows about the late stuff, but where yeah. you really sort of got your teeth into uh, traveling, writing and, and producing content. Yeah. Yeah, no. Well, this was the dial up internet era. It was really before blogging. And so I got a big break for what was at the time salon.com was sort of, it was sort of the New Yorker of the online world. It, really doesn't have that reputation anymore. But at the time, just a lot of people read that. And so suddenly I was just a 28 year old wandering the earth, but I was getting my byline next to some important writers. And um, that was good. I got some feedback. And actually, this is a funny detail I, I haven't told in a long time, that actually I got so much feedback from readers. Again, this is before social media, it was before blogging, that I had two kinds of questions all the time. One, how do you become a travel writer? Well, I didn't know how to become a travel writer. You know, I knew how to, I'd become a travel writer. So I started an interview series where every month I would interview a different travel writer with the same 10 questions. And I'm still doing that. It, uh, gosh, 22 years on, I'm still interviewing a travel writer a month to answer those questions that I couldn't answer. Uh, the other question was, how can you afford to travel for so long? And so I put up this, what I called at the time, of, my column actually for Salon was called Vagabonding. And so I called my so Vagabonding Suggest a Festo. I thought a Vagabonding Manifesto was a little bit too heavy handed. Who, who was I to tell people what to think? And so the actually my 10 point manifesto was more about philosophy than about what to pack or you know how to save money or where to go. Uh, because to me, it felt like it was that sh it was that philosophical shift that was important. It was the idea of seeing time as my truest form of wealth. Um, and I, so I, I didn't really quote travel writers. I quoted a lot of poets and essayists just sort of talking about what in life should be important and when you should make your dreams uh, an action-oriented pursuit. And so through a weird set of circumstances, again, I come from a very provincial part of the United States, I had a little email newsletter where I just sort of carbon copied, you know, 30 people who wanted to hear from me during this time. One of them was my high school English teacher who uh, replied and told me about a trip he'd taken to Arkansas. So I put a little detail about that in my next newsletter. And he was so happy that I put him in my newsletter that he forwarded it to all of his people on his mailing list, one of which was a former student who'd moved to New York and become an editor at Random House. And so I, I got this random email from uh, a woman who'd actually gone to my high school, but I didn't know her. I went to a pretty big high school. Uh, and she said, do you want to make this into a book? And I said, sure. And so it's strange that I went around the world and it was through a Wichita, Kansas connection uh, in the middle of the United States that I was connected with Random House. And they were experimenting with eBooks at the time. It wasn't initially going to be a paper book, but then they decided that eBooks, there wasn't a history for eBooks. Who would, who would have guessed, you know, that was before Kindle. Um, and so they, but they liked the book. So they bumped it up to Villard, which is a imp publisher imprint. And uh, I ended up being on the same uh, publishing imprint as John Krakauer and Tim Cahill, even though I was barely 30 years old. And they published, um, Vagabond and came out around the time the United States was invading Iraq, you know, during the Gulf War. And nobody really, not the Gulf War, but the Iraq War. And nobody really wanted to talk about travel in the media. And so I thought, well, that was nice. And it's just been this grassroots uh, success that over the years, people have passed it to their friends. Um, I, I guess in a sense, writing it towards my 18 year old self talked, spoke to a lot of people's 18 year old self, a lot of people's you know 23 year old self, a lot of people's 77 year old self, that somehow this idea that travel is something should be something that you should do now, slowly caught on. I got a big bump in, in 2007 when Tim Ferriss released the four hour work week and was a real um, um, fan of vagabonding and really recommended it as a book. And so suddenly my book, which was in the travel department was attracting people who had gone to the business book department, may not have gone to the travel department, but suddenly they realized, yeah, maybe I should, if I want to travel, I should do it now. You know, I should see time as my truest form of wealth. And so it's just this strange journey that the book has taken from being a, a, a strangely uh, good luck from being on a big press publisher, but then it became, it wasn't really reviewed in many newspapers, but it became this grassroots success 
that people still uh, love to ask me about to this day, and I still love to talk about to this day. So much to unpack there. Uh, thanks for sharing the, the details on that. One of the biggest takeaways is, is yeah, it's, it's become a cult classic, and, and part of any thing that becomes cult classic, you then become a cult icon. So, mm-hmm. yeah, congratulations on the success of that. And, and one of my questions I was going to ask you was, did you know it was going to be success sort of 19 years later after publishing it in 2003 that where you are now in 2022 and people are still talking about, um, you know, the first book you, you've written and you put all your content and context in there? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I think when, you, when you're in the rush of having written your first book and you're feeling good about it, you, you think, like there's a, a part of me thought, this is the, book, the best book I'll ever write. You know, the, the, so I felt like I put everything into it. Um, a, actually, I have a new book coming out this fall that I can't really talk about too much, but it's sort of the spiritual um, sequel to Vagabonding. And it really, 20 years later, throws a lot more of everything I've learned into a new book. But yeah, at the time I thought this I feel, I'm not sure, but I feel like this is going to be special, you know, but at the same rate, I drove, I wrote that book in a room in Thailand. You know, I had, um, I'd grown up in Kansas. I think I'd been to New York once. Um, I would just sort of, it was mostly just me and my pack wandering the world. I really didn't have the connections. Again, it wasn't really reviewed in any major places. And so Random House put me on a book tour. It was well attended. I felt really good about it. Uh, It did make it in a few uh, American newspapers like USA Today and the Boston Globe. But then um, it was it was a moderate success the first year. But what happened is every year it was the same moderate success. And when when you sell a lot of books every year for for almost 20 years, it ends up being, yeah, a cult, a a cult success. And so, yeah, it it, it totally it surprised me. It, It caught me off guard in the best of ways that I was really optimistic that it was it was there was something special. But I think. The fact that I'm still talking about it almost 20 years later bears that out, that it, that I, in that little room in Thailand, two years after having wandered Asia, I did write something yeah. that uh, had a little bit of lasting effect. Well, you've inspired me. So that was one of the reasons why I packed up in 2011 and, and me and my uh, partner at the time, which is now my wife, I've been with her for 13 years. She had the travel right. bargain basically said to me, um, I'm going to travel Europe and the UK and the world and so you either coming with me or you're not. So I really had no choice. So we sold up everything, uh, moved everything into storage that we didn't sell, um, left both of our jobs, told all the friends and family, we got a two year visa because my family's from England and we're from uh, sunny Melbourne, Australia down there. So we left okay. everything and traveled the world with um, a backpack. Uh, we, and then we ended up settling in, in uh, Wimbledon, we lived in London and uh, funny mm. story, I ended up living with a girl and I'm shout out, her name's Monica. Uh, she was a travel writer uh, from the Travel Hack. So she's been doing it now for about 20 years. But it's funny enough that when you go vagabonding, you meet other vagabonders just by chance. Mm. Um, So, yeah, I just want to say thanks for the inspiration on that. And uh, that gave me a lot of time to, you know, find out who I was, travel the world and and get a a complete understanding. So, yeah, just wanted to little segue on that as well. Um, Glad to hear that. That's great. Thank you. Um, now, a couple other things. Obviously, you've got 52 years of experience of life. So um, a couple little cool stories that I do sort of want to unpack is um, we can jump into Vagabonding soon, but tell me a little bit about Thailand, as you said, and the movie The Beach with Leonardo DiCaprio and how you crashed the set. What's that story about? Yeah, that that really that got my foot into the world of travel writing. I had written for Salon a few times before, but... That one was tied into the movie The Beach, which now is not one of the major Leonardo DiCaprio's career movies. But at the time, he'd just come off of Titanic, which was huge. Everybody wanted to know what was happening. They were filming the movie at at this top secret location in Thailand when I had showed up in Thailand. And the story of The Beach, which is a terrific novel by Alex Garland, is about these travelers who find this very secluded and hard to reach beach that nobody knows about. And as I traveled in my early days through town, I thought, well, we have this secluded and hard to reach beach that everybody knows about, right? They're literally, they, co-PP, they had uh, cordoned it off to shoot Leonardo DiCaprio's movie there. And I thought, what would happen if I tried to sneak on the least secret island in the world? What if I tried to, to crash the set of this movie? And so I ended up failing basically to, to crash the set of the movie, but in the process of writing about the attempt, 
it sort of became this philosophical thought about what is it that we desire when we travel? Uh, it sort of reached much like vagabonding and a lot of my writing has, it reached sort of this philosophical level that even though I ended up getting turned back by the by the police boats uh, as I tried to rent a boat to get into the, the beach, I thought about, well, why do I wanna go there? Why does anyone want to go to a super isolated beach to have it to themselves. And one one funny twist about Garland's book is that it's not just isolated from other travelers, it's also isolated from locals. It's this idea that you have the, that air quotes paradise is this place that is somehow a perfect beach that's tied off from any specific culture. So it was this weird irony that the story was about this, why go to Thailand and, and avoid ties, but have the beach to yourself. And so I examined that in the story itself. It was a cover story on Salon. Bill Bryson chose it for the best American travel writing 2000, uh, which is a great thing for my career. Uh, but yeah, it was just, it was just really funny how obsessed everyone was with that movie at the time. And it was really from a different world of travel. Like these days with Instagram and things like that, I'm not sure if a bunch of travelers could keep a secret on an isolated beach like that. You know, I think that those see, in fact, this is another tangent, but it feels like there's an extent to which with social media, everybody sort of wants to go to the most fashionable places in the old banana pancake trail that I traveled through Southeast Asia at the time thanks to social media, but even more so budget airlines, people will fly from Bangkok to Bali instead of island hopping from Bangkok to Bali. I was in Sumatra a few years ago and there weren't as many backpackers as I expected because you no longer have to island hop across Sumatra and Java to get to Bali. Uh, so in a way, when I stormed Leonardo DiCaprio's The Beach years ago, it was a moment in travel history that's a little bit different. It was dial-up internet. It was pre-social media. It was pre-budget airlines. Uh, it was a blast. It was an exciting time to be in Thailand, but uh, Thailand is a different uh, place. The whole world is a different place to travel to now because of different factors. And do you find that sort of back in the day, time was a little bit slow with travel, like the days were longer, where now everyone's on their phones taking photos of the perfect spot. And they're not really experiencing the culture and not taking it all in as a person. They're more living on their devices. Do you find that? Uh, I do. I do. Yeah. I, um, one thing I come back to again and again and again, it's, I'm mean, going to write about it in the new book is that um, one of the three of the big gifts of travel, three big counterintuitive gifts of travel when I was that age was being lonely, lost and bored. You know, that uh, you go to another country and pretty soon you're a little bit lonely. And so what do you do? You, you break out of your shell. You start talking to people. You go find other travelers. You, you learn a little bit of the, the Thai language or whatever country you're in. And you end up meeting the couple kids in the village who can speak a little bit of English. And pretty soon you are not lonely anymore, right? Yeah. Um, you're bored, you know. You, you've read all the books in your backpack that back when books were made of paper. Um, you're not sure what else to do. Well, you, you leave your room, you wander around the streets, you you walk until your day becomes becomes interesting, to use a phrase I used in vagabonding, and suddenly you're not bored anymore. You're having adventures. Or while you're wandering around, suddenly you're not sure where you are. So you really have to use your use your brain. You know, you have to you have to figure out where you are. And suddenly in being lost, you suddenly realize that you're not really lost because every place is this awesome new part of a place you've never been before. And it makes you uh, interact with the place. Well, now with the smartphone and God bless the smartphone, it's um, I still, I travel with it, but I really have to be disciplined so that when I'm lost, I just find my route. You know, suddenly I'm not lost anymore. And I'm because I'm because I can go exactly where I wanted to go. It's harder to go to the places I didn't know I wanted to go. Like yeah. being lost suddenly make means you're in a new neighborhood that you hadn't planned on being in. But it's sort of awesome and it's sort of better than what you'd planned on being in. Similarly, when I'm bored, I can listen to a podcast. God, I mean, even a couple of years ago when I knew better, I would listen to podcasts a lot. You know, when I was in Sumatra. Um, Lonely, lost, and, and lonely. Yeah, no, I can I can text my friends back home. I can FaceTime my family. Basically, that smartphone solves so many problems, but it takes away that lonely, lost, bored texture of travel that I encourage. I try not to be snotty about it I, with younger generations because I remember what it was like to be a young traveler. But just to say, look, guys, you know, you don't need to use that all the time because part of the joy of travel is being lonely, lost, and bored, not knowing what happens next, not having a plan. Uh, and not really communicating with people back home, not performing pictures for your Instagram account, but just being where you are, slowing down and being surprised by the journey. 
And is that why you're lonely and bored and walked into an Indian ashram and started doing tantric sex? <laughs> What's the story yeah. on that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that ended up being a story in my second book, Marco Polo Didn't Go There. Um, yeah. I think I was wondering, again, yeah, I was, I was just sort of trying to find interesting new experiences. And a few weeks earlier, I'd gone to the Kumbh Mela, which is sort of a, a Hindu festival that happens every 12 years. And that year, it was the 12th, 12th year. So it was the 144th year. And there were like 8 million people there. I mean, how many times do you go to an event with 8 million people? Uh, and the toilets don't can't keep up, right? So it's a, it's a different task. But then a couple of weeks later, talking to different travelers, they said, you should go to Rishikesh. It's interesting. I'd heard about the Rishikesh. Uh, you know, the Beatles had gone there back before I was born. Uh, and when I got there, there were these ashrams and somebody said, there's this, there's sort of this ashram that's run by a Romanian guy and they teach Tantra, including tantric sex. Right. And so I thought, well, what, what do I have to lose? So I went to this place. Uh, I stayed in a very simple room. It was a very inexpensive experience to go to these, uh, t uh tantra classes. Um, and I think what I, I ended up having this experience that, I don't know, the, the class itself was interesting, but not really useful. It's like, I'm not a Tantra master now, but the story I ended up writing about it, I, I you know, I, I was very attracted to this, this woman I never talked to. Um, and I realized there is a parallel and sometimes we're attracted to people who seem very beautiful and exotic, but we don't really understand them. The same thing can happen in travel. You go to a place that's very beautiful and exotic and you, you know nothing about it, except that you're supposed to be there. And so I sort of paralleled my, my complete fascination with this woman I was too shy to talk to with this place that I was completely fascinated by, but I didn't really know much about. And, and by the end of the story, it turns out that the woman was not as worthy of, of my um, fascination as I thought. She was just another American like me. She wasn't as exotic as I thought. Um, but yeah, I, I, I sort of superimposed those two things that um, you can go to these strange corners of the world and uh, you can surprise yourself sometimes by being a fool. And sometimes it's, it's good to be a fool and learn a few lessons, uh, a few humbling lessons about what the world is like. Yeah. That's thanks for unpacking that. That's a cool story. Where did you meet yeah. your wife? Where did you meet your wife? Oh, this is, this is, I love this story. Um, I wandered the earth for almost 50 years as a bachelor. Um, and you know, had some fun relationships, but I was sort of a loner, you know, I, I was sort of doing, was doing my own thing and I was sort of stubborn. I wanted to, I, I ended up getting some property in Kansas back where I started. Um, one nice thing about having property in Kansas is that it's a fairly inexpensive part of the United States to live. It's not a sexy destination part of the United States, but I have family here. I was able to have a house uh, for a lot less money than other parts of the United States or other parts of the world and have it as a home base. So for years I was coming and going from Kansas. And usually when I had romantic relationships, they were in other parts of the world. Well, I was a bachelor, a 49 year old bachelor when the pandemic hit uh, in early 2020. And um, just out of boredom, I got on a dating app Bumble and started seeing matches. And here's, here's this woman who's like, 60 miles away who has pictures of herself in Prague and, and in London and in Germany and hiking trails through the Alps. And I thought, no, this, this can't be real. <laughs> well, you were getting catfished. You thought, well, I, I, I really thought so. And it was, it was a time I should have been in Italy. I was going to take my nephew to Italy after his high school graduation. And then I was going to go to Switzerland and other places I hadn't been to before in Europe, you know, like probably like many Australians, I started my travel in Asia because it's inexpensive, but I hadn't really been to a lot of classic European places because I didn't have enough money yet. Well, I was going to take my nephew to, to Italy. My wife should have been in Germany where she was living at the time, but we were both back home because you couldn't travel at the outset of, of COVID. And it was like, I, I met my, um, you know, my, my other half, you know, I, I met the person I was supposed to meet. And so it was this strange bit of irony. She was a very well-traveled. She's, she's, She's a big trekker. She's trekked in South America. She's trekked in the Alps. She's lived in London. She's lived in Germany. She was from Kansas and she loves Kansas in the way that I love Kansas. And uh, she was, it was, it was, it was, I would just, I just feel super lucky. I, I like, I met my soulmate during this horrible moment in, in world history. Um, and I've spent almost every day with her since then. She's in another other room right now. We got married. I proposed marriage five months after I met her. After being a stubborn bachelor for 50 years, I decided I was going to, I needed to ask her to marry me before I turned 50. So yeah. the morning of my birthday, I did that. We got married uh, back in May of 2021. And um, 
I'm looking forward to traveling with her now. It's it's pretty exciting. Awesome. Well, up is a real thing. No one talks about it, but uh, up is a real thing as well. Um, yeah. Congratulations. That That's fantastic. I mean, you never know yeah. who you're going to meet and when you're going to meet, but when you're ready and you go on Bumble, yeah, you're, you're there to do the business. So <laughs> <laughs> no, well, Bumble is the Bumble is the strange footnote, but uh, no, it's, it's, um, I don't know if I was lucky or stubborn or what happened, but I just, it never felt right. N- nothing ever felt right as, as, 10 minutes into my first date with my now wife. So I really feel lucky and, and blessed. And, and it, she's sort of a travel love, but in my home state, you know, that we both traveled the world in different directions. And we've, we've tried to figure out where we would have met each other besides Kansas during the pandemic. And we may not have. So it's a strange story. I'm sure there's so many stories out there as well that are, are very similar. So it's going to be, hmm. what's the future travels with uh, you and your wife? And that's going to be very interesting because she's going to, going to go right. She's going to go left and and welcome to the right. world of marriage. I've been with my wife for about 13 years together. I only yeah. married for six. We're coming up to our six year wedding anniversary. And yeah. Um, yeah. What's, what's that going to be like for you sort of, you know, post COVID and post traveling? Is there any plans on um, any travels in the next sort of 12 to 24 months yourself? Yeah, well, in inshallah, as they say in Arabic speaking lands, we will we'll get some travel in the summer. Literally, we I haven't been on a plane. I'm actually going to the West Coast of the United States next month, uh, but I haven't been. It'll be my first time on a plane since March of 2020. Uh, my wife, uh, who's an actor and has to go to New York and other places from time to time, has been on a plane. And we've done some road tripping. Uh, our honeymoon was to Colorado, which is a special place to both of us in our childhood and a, a, a particularly a special place because her family has a cabin there. We also went to New York, uh, but by road. So I haven't been on, um, on an airplane in a long while. Fingers crossed, I would love to go this summer to Kenya, which is a place I've really wanted to go to for a long time. I was in Kenya for about... 12 hours back in 2008. I'd really love to go back there. I'd love to climb Mount Kenya with my, with my Trekker wife. Uh, I've been teaching a writing class in Paris since 2005. I'd like to go back and resume that. It's been postponed for the last two years. Fingers crossed I can do that in July. And then my wife has family in Norway and I've never been to Norway. I've been to many parts of Europe, but never Norway specifically. So fingers crossed we'll do some trekking in Kenya. I'll teach some classes in, in, in Paris. And uh, she might go to London because that's where she did drama school years ago. And then uh, we'll do some fjord hiking in, in Norway. And I will scratch my travel itch before my new travel book comes out this fall. Awesome. Awesome. Sounds like, uh, sounds fun. Uh, talk to me about yeah. Australia. You've been to Australia before, of course. Yeah. 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 I, I've been to Australia um, two and a half times. Once I was just sort of transiting. I didn't really spend much time there. Um, but the first time I went there, it was basically on, a, it was like on a press trip, a tourism, actually Northern territories, tourism, we're bringing travel riders to Northern ter- territories. I spent five weeks there. It was amazing. And one funny thing about that is that a lot of Australians have spent more time in Bali than 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 Alice Springs or Northern Territories, or, you know, or I'm Darwin. Guilty, right? I'm guilty myself. I'm actually planning the boys' trip to uh, Alice Springs, and me and a couple of mates are going to drive there in a van. Uh, okay. It's 23 hour road trip just wow. from Melbourne, just from Melbourne, and wow. that's just the next state sort of uh, over. Have you been to Melbourne, Australia, before? I have, and I'm very fond of Melbourne. Actually, I spoke at the the I think it was the Melbourne Festival of Travel Writing. Um, about 10 years ago and, um, did a side trip to Tasmania, which, which I loved. Um, but, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, uh, America, United States metaphors here, you know, like Alice Springs is Kansas, right. It's right in the middle. Right. And a lot of people, a lot of Americans don't go to Kansas, just like Australians don't go to Alice Springs, but Melbourne really struck me as the New York to Sydney's LA of, of Australia. And I like both cities in the U S but I'm really a New York guy. I like those big cosmopolitan cities. Um, I had a great time. Uh, I taught a little class there. I did some speaking and really, really enjoyed Melbourne. I'd like to spend some more time there. Uh, so yeah, I know. I think I'm, people, I'm happy to give you the, I'm happy to give you the local tour next time you're down. So no problem at all. All right. So, you want to come Perfect. down and be a speaker at one of my events. We, we're running events with international authors to get on stage and talk about their story as well. So maybe in the future we could uh, pair something together, but that, that would be, that would be fantastic. Terrific. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to get back there. Now a couple, I've obviously got uh, 17 pages of questions and we've probably got about five right. minutes to go. So right. I'll, do, right. I'll sort of speed it up. So I'll just give people a bit of a, a, a quick background. So yeah, Vagabonding was your first book, but um, just shoot, what were the next books? So people that who have sort of read Vagabonding, uh, but you've got other works. So talk about your other works. 
Yeah, it's, it's a curious journey because the, my book that's coming out this fall that I can't talk a lot about in detail yet is also a random house book. It's also very much in the spirit of vagabonding. So, um, and of course I've done these other projects. I went around the world with no luggage. I have a podcast. I've done some television, but my second book was a collection of travel essays. Marco Polo didn't go there. That includes the tantric sex for dilettante story and the storming in the beach story. It was just sort of a collection of, of my first 10 years of travel writing as well as end notes, sort of story behind the story. Um, I called it a DVD extra, but now people don't use DVDs anymore, right? So that's my second book. Uh, my third book is, which is probably my least read book, is part of the 33 and a third series out of Bloomsbury in the United States. It's for, for well-known uh, music albums. And mine is about a gangster rap album called, uh, called The Ghetto Boys that came out in 1990. It was remixed by... Um, uh, by Rick Rubin, who's done Johnny Cash and Red Hot Chili Peppers and a lot of other famous artists. But it was this, it was this really edgy gangster rap group. And in a way, it's sort of a travel book too, because it made me go to Houston, Texas. It was, it made me scared of human tech, Houston, Texas in the way that straight out of Compton makes you scared of uh, Southern California. And so I went there to see what it was like. And I wrote a book about that album and what is special about that part of the fifth word part of Houston, Texas. My fourth book was, um, was Souvenir, which is about a cultural history of souvenirs. I'm really happy with that. That That's a so more of a scholarly travel book, but it's really any any question you had to, to a- ask about uh, souvenirs is answered in that book. And uh, my fourth, my fifth book, which is out this fall and doesn't have a title yet, is sort of uh, Vagabonding 2, uh, 20 years on. So um, yeah, everything has a travel taste to it, but it's been fun to go off in different directions and write a book about music that's sort of about travel or write a book about souvenirs that's about travel in a very, very focused way. Absolutely. And if it wasn't for you, there'll be no Tim Ferriss and no Tim Ferriss podcast. Or Yeah. Hmm. So um, a lot of people don't know, you know, you sometimes, you know, the road less travel, you're the one walking through the forest with a machete, uh, clearing the path for other people to come past and create success. So I'm sure you, you know, you're in charge or not in charge, but you've mentored or, you know, motivated thousands of people around the world to go out there and travel with uh, just a backpack or in in some cases no no luggage a couple of other yeah. stories uh, i want to talk about you traveled uh, israel by foot is that correct yeah i walked across israel 22 years ago um and i i um i sort of wanted to walk across israel jesus style so i went up to uh, capernaum uh, where he, where which is his hometown uh, near the sea of galilee up north and started walking south across israel and uh, it was in may which in the United States is fine, but in Israel is a pretty hot time of year to walk across Israel. So after walking, I made it to, to Nazareth. Um, I made it to Megiddo. And then I decided to start hitchhiking just because it was, it was too hot. It was too brutal. Um, and actually, Israel is so funny. Um, in the United States, a, a couple of um, attractive young women probably wouldn't pick up a random guy with a cowboy hat on. I, I bought this cowboy hat that I was walking across Israel in. Well, these two Israeli, these two super cute Israeli girls picked me up, I think, uh, because all Israeli young people uh, have military training, you know, so that so even even though that they were they were women, there's just no way I would mess with them. And so I, I befriended them. They took me to Tel Aviv. I hung out with them in Tel Aviv for a few days. And then I eventually took a shroot uh, taxi to, to Jerusalem. It's interesting. I've, I've done a podcast about that with, with Ari Shafir, who often comes on my podcast. And Ari has a Orthodox Jewish background. And so he spent time as a young Jewish man in Israel. But I've never written about that. I'll have to eventually, because it was just a really, Jerusalem is just a, have you been to Jerusalem? No, I haven't. No. no. Okay. Yeah. No, it's just a, such a fascinating city. It's, 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 it's very important to three religions and it, you know, you're walking through the pages of history, but it's just sort of a bizarre, fascinating place. I, I went out to Jericho uh, to finish my, my biblical footsteps journey. And I slept in a cave at the, the monastery of the temptation. Basically it's the part of the Bible where Jesus is tempted by the devil. They built a monastery there and the, wow. the monks let me sleep there uh, basically to get rid of me. I wanted to sleep in the monastery and they're like, there's some caves down the mountain, go sleep there. And I just had this amazing, amazing experience that I really should write about someday. But it just goes to show that going, experiencing a place on foot is different than going by bus or by motorcycle or bicycle or by camel. It was just really amazing to experience Israel and, and parts of Palestine uh, on foot. Um, amazing. Yeah, you definitely should write or talk on um I know you said you've got the podcast and you spoke about it before. Where can people find uh, your podcast? What's it called? When did it start? And, and where can people listen to it? 
Yeah, I uh, it started in uh, 2017. Tim Ferriss was my first guest. And I basically said, Tim, tell me how to make a podcast because he's so good at that. <laughs> and yeah. it's funny, you know, I, I Vagabonding was an influence on him. But through him, it's been an influence on many other people. Like uh, many people are, are very, listen very closely to what he says. And he's introduced my work to a lot of people. Um, yeah, so because I was a big listener of podcasts, of course, I'd been on his podcast. And I listened to a lot of other podcasts. It sort of became a part of my mental activity. I wanted to be a part of the conversation. Yet I didn't want to be, you know, shoehorned into just talking about travel all the time. So I decided to call it Deviate with Rolf Potts and it's on most any podcasting platform. Uh, you can go to rolfpotts.com slash deviate or but basically um, Deviate with Rolf Potts, just search it at any podcast platform. And I wanted to be able to talk about travel, but also talk about punk rock or um, the guy who owns my barn who played a basketball game where everybody fouled out except for him. Or my friends that I grew up with um, who are of different racial backgrounds than me. Basically, anything that interested me, including travel, I wanted to be a part of my podcast. And so, for example, as we are talking about this right now, my most current interview is with uh, Harley Rustad, who wrote a book about Justin Alexander, the, the American backpacker who disappeared in India, and the book he wrote about that. Very much a travel po episode. But the week before, I talked about mixtapes and how when I was 21, that's how you traded music. You know, there wasn't Spotify in 1992. So you would record music and trade it with your friends. And so I've really enjoyed being able to have episodes about things like cassette tapes or dinosaurs or things that aren't necessarily about travel, but just interest me. It's nostalgia. probably, it's, yeah. Having a yeah, podcast nostalgia. That nostalgia. Yeah. Yeah, no, that was a really special one because it was about how I met my wife. I, I took a lot of old cassette tapes of my own voice when I was 19 or six years old. And it sort of became this essay episode um, that was a very personal one for me. And again, if I hadn't have made room for that in my podcast, I might not have been able to do it, but I thought, well, I just met my wife during a pandemic. Um, nostalgia suffuses so much of, of my brain space sometimes that I am going to do an episode about nostalgia. And so it's been fun creatively, like vagabonding will, will probably be what I'm always known for. Even if my new book is just as popular, I'll always be the vagabonding guy. So it's been fun to give myself permission creatively to do some other things. And the yeah. podcast has really allowed me to do that. And people have, like I did a, a, a podcast episode about the sport of professional indoor soccer. I don't know if you have that in Australia, but uh, my yeah. little my little Kansas hometown had a had a major league indoor soccer team when I was a kid, and it just felt so special to me that I did, a, did an episode about that. And so, yeah, I, I, I just to, I used to play indoor soccer. It's funny you said I used to play indoor soccer. I loved no it. No kidding. And I was no good kidding. at it. I'm a striker. I can head the ball. You know, I'm actually was very good for probably about three months, and then I, you know, then life got in the way. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. That brings up nostalgia for me as well. I totally forgot about that yeah. as well. Yeah. No, so it's so it's just been sort of a canvas for my entire life. My podcast is, and as the new book comes out, I'll have a new season that's tied in to the book. So it'll be all travel from about mid twenty twenty two to mid twenty twenty three. But I've done a lot of fun non travel stuff on the podcast too, and I've I've really been it's really been a fun part of my career in the last few years. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. So yeah, for people listening, um, check out the podcast. What's it called? Uh, Deviate with Rolf Potts. Um, okay. And what's the best platform people can listen in? On is it iTunes? Is it Spotify, Google Podcast, or uh, they can listen to any of those. Um, yeah. uh, most of my traffic comes through Spotify or uh, or Apple Podcasts. Um, if you can't find it on your favorite app, then uh, let me know. Just email me at deviate at rolfpost.com and I'll try to get on your platform. Or it's literally at rolfpost.com slash deviate. You can stream it through my website, all the episodes. So yeah, it's legend, not legend. that hard to find. A couple of last questions before we wrap up, and I ask this question to everyone, but it's going to be very interesting for you. So if you were to host a dinner party with three people, dead or alive, from the past, who would they be? And not where would you take it, but yeah, what location, what country, what restaurant, what food, three people, dinner party, hosted by yourself, who are they and why? Goodness. Well, it's funny. I met my wife when I was 49. So one of them would be my wife, because at this point, I don't want to spend any more hours without hanging out with my no, wife. No, no. So yeah, your wife has to come. So three other people apart from your wife. Oh, so, you, okay. So yeah, let's do it. She's also a foodie. So uh, maybe we would go to one of her favorite places or my favorite places. She lived in Germany for a while, but you know, maybe Italy, maybe Italy. Let's just say Italy because Italy. Um, Who's coming? I Who's missed coming? Italy. Italy is where I should have been when I, when, when I met my wife in my home state of Kansas. So let's say it's Italy. Oh, this is, this is really hard. Um, 
I, my new book, I write about people through in the entire course of history. So this might be esoteric and unique to the current moment that it's in, but maybe Matsuo Basho, do you know Basho, the Japanese poet who walked across the length of Japan years ago? No. I mentioned him because I just met his book and he just seems like this very interesting centered guy. We might need a translator, but if he could speak English, I would love to hear his take on things. It was hundreds of years ago that he basically walked on foot through Japan. Um, and then, gosh, since I mentioned it again, I'm, this is sort of being auto-suggested, but probably Jesus Christ of, of Nazareth, just so we can compare walking notes, if nothing else, and just so I could get it, you know, directly from him. So, I've oh, and then right, I have one. I've got him right there. Maybe, maybe we'll throw in the Buddha as well, and uh, we'll call it a party. Uh, <laughs> actually, no, no. Let's let's do it seriously, because actually, I quote my new book has a lot of actually has a lot of stuff from Christian pilgrimages, but also from, from Buddhist pilgrimages as well. So let's learn the Buddha as well. Gautama Buddha, for sure. Cool. I've got both of them here behind me, but uh, nice. I've got to research the other one. So where would you take them? So three, the, are, are you going for a walk? So you'll have a dinner first and then maybe a walk or spend a couple of couple of days and can, and just listen and compare notes and stories. And you maybe yourself, the- you're, you're a walker as well. You're the, you're the modern day uh, Jesus and the Buddha walking around telling <laughs> stories as well. So, yeah. A, a, a little bit, but I'm, I married my match. My wife is is more of an experienced walker than me. So I think maybe the Dolomites, we'd go up to, up, up you know, by Italy's border with uh, Switzerland and Austria. And we might start with a hike, maybe go up to one of the huttas up, up in the Austrian Alps. And I think we would carry on ingredients and we would cook something awesome, maybe a little bit Italian, but also maybe a global meal, a little bit of, uh, a little bit of curry and uh, a little bit of Kansas barbecue as well. Uh, gosh, it'd be a great, TV, it'd be a great TV series, probably a, a Netflix yeah. five part episode. You know, that'd be great. A couple random yeah. questions. So some random questions. Have you, did you ever meet Anthony Bourdain? I didn't know. Um, and, and it's a shame that I had meant to reach out to him to interview him for years. And I had a lot of respect for him, um, just because there's, there's travel media personalities, you know, that for better or worse, have a lot to say about travel, but it feels like they talk about travel more than they travel. And there was something very true and, and very um, earnest about the way he traveled. Um, and so it's a shame. No, I never met him. Yeah. Uh, just a couple, couple, two quotes. Um, so we sure. play the quote game. I'm going to say a couple of quotes from your book. And I just want you to really unpack it really quickly. So one of your great sure. quotes is war is God's way of teaching Americans geography. Right. That's, that's actually not my quote. Um, and it, I, at the top of my head, I can't think of it. I can't think of who said that maybe Ambrose Bierce or someone, some, some humorist from about a hundred years ago said that. And it's about the man bites dog world of how we get our news and information these days, you know, that, that, um, we think the red, and this, I'm, this is America specific. I don't know how it is in Australia, but we're so insular in the United States that if, if something happens in the other part of the world, it has to be something that's blowing up, you know, something disastrous. Um, and so in a way, uh, those of us in the United States are a little bit undereducated about the rest of the world simply because we don't read about it um, unless something bad is happening there. We don't know about, can, everybody knows where Iraq is. Everybody knows where Vietnam is because those were two serious American wars in recent memory. But fewer people know about Syria or about you know, Kuwait or Iran or Laos or Myanmar or other places that are very near those places and are just as fascinating. And so I think I said that I tried, tried to say it as gently as possible, just to say that there are, there are better reasons to reach out and expand your knowledge of the world, not just as places, as things to see, but places to experience. And, and one thing that makes me a little bit nervous about our Instagram culture now is that too many people see places as, as backdrops, um, for themselves, as opposed to places to interact with. Now, that might not be a fair analysis of of Instagram, but I think that finding a dynamic and really full-hearted way of interacting with the culture that goes beyond taking your picture in front of its most beautiful sites is an important thing. In addition to the warm geography thing, you know, just I, I try to encourage people to get past the obvious places where they get their picture taken and talk to people and, and be surprised and allow a place to catch you off guard. Yeah, amazing. Um, thank you for unpacking that quote. And yeah, your name was next to it. So maybe you just re-quoted it because it's an amazing quote. I myself right. wrote a quote book, uh, it took me 30 years to write. I, I researched 500 books and that's how I started Best Book Bits. But I understand quotes. Nice. Sometimes they get attributed yeah, yeah. to the person who re-quoted them. Now, another yeah. cool quote, you said, world travel doesn't have to be a wealthy person's sport. 
Yeah. Well, it, I think there's different economies in which we can travel and the travel industry, God bless the travel industry, but it makes us think that we have to buy the most expensive hotel and plane ticket and tour of a place when in fact you can travel within local economies and actually a much larger percentage of your money goes to local economies when you're traveling on the same train that Thai people take or Chinese people take or Russian people take or you know South African people take. Um, and that literally when you're traveling in the local economy, you're sort of answering to the price uh, sets of that economy. And so when you're traveling in a place where the dollar is strong, like um, Thailand or Egypt or Costa Rica, then you're literally, you can literally spend less per day than you would at home in an industrialized country um, simply because you're traveling in that local economy. And, and so, yeah, it's not a rich person's game. I think we're, we, we think that travel is for wealthy people and retired people when in fact, if we just educate ourselves a little bit and realize that, that not only is that chicken bus going across Guatemala a lot cheaper than the air conditioned taxi, it's going to be more interesting. You're going to meet more Guatemalan people. You're going to hold their chickens while they go off and buy some peanuts from the window. That, that basically not only is the less expensive way to travel more interesting, it is often more culturally interactive and it's sometimes more environmentally sustainable. You know, in an age when you can fly from Bangkok to Bali and not have to go over land, or you can fly from London uh, to Corfu, Greece and not have to hitchhike your way there. It's actually cheaper to go over. It's more environmentally sustainable not to take those flights and to take overland transit that's going to immerse you in the culture anyway. So, yeah, to this day, I, I'm, I'm wealthier than I was when, than I wrote Vagabonding, but I still love traveling on the cheap because for several reasons, including that it's just a lot more interesting. Yeah, I, I can attest I traveled for 12 months. Uh, we had a home base in, in Wimbledon in London, but traveling Europe from there was, uh, yeah, on the cheap and, you know, budget airlines and all that stuff and weekend trips. So, yeah, thank you for all the work you've done. And and we um, obviously the world really appreciates travel riders. And as I said, I know, I know a few of them and a couple of friends myself, a couple of shout outs to Josh Humphreys, who's an Australian, uh, we used to be best friends when we were 14, 15. And he's done six mm. books now when he travels the world and he's in Mexico now. So, Shout out to him and Andrew DiGiorgio on doing van life. Got a friend doing van life, sold up everything recently. Traveling the Great Ocean Road in Victoria with his family in a bus. So people really have gravitated towards this. You can travel on the cheap and, you know, maximize the experience out of the day as well. So I just want to thank you, uh, Rolf, for all your work you've done and, and all the content that you've put out as well. Yeah, that's good to hear. And good luck in the journeys that you have before you when, no when, when it becomes safe to do so. Absolutely. Now, for my audience uh, who don't know where to follow you on social, where do you live on social apart from the podcast? What's your favorite platform? Uh, ooh, that's a good question. I, I just complained about Instagram, but I sort of like Instagram sometimes. I'm not very regular on Instagram, but I'm when I do uh, post there, I'm, I'm, I sort of enjoy the interactions there. I'm at Rolf Potts. I'm also at Rolf Potts at Twitter. Uh, and that's probably the um, uh, rolfpost.com. I have an old school author website, which actually has 20 years of my own writing on it. It has links to all my books, all of my essays, all my podcast episodes, all of my videos and TV work are there too. So rolfpost.com is a good place to start because it also links to my social media. Perfect. And we'll catch up again when the new book comes out. I'll do a summary of it and uh, we'll promote it to the audience as well. So enjoy the rest of your year and uh, enjoy marriage. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. I'm off to a great start. I appreciate talking to you, Michael. Perfect. Legend. Have a great day. All right. All right. See ya.